My name is Skylar Siegman, and I did not believe anxiety was a real thing. I always thought it was something that was fake and that people made up in their head until I experienced it for myself my freshman year of college. I'd just gotten back after a weekend. I got back to Abilene, went in my dorm, put all my stuff down. It immediately felt like my whole world was crumbling in on me. Um, so I went to my car um, and cried uncontrollably for multiple hours. And I was freaking out because I felt, I literally felt insane. Um, I felt crazy because I had never experienced anything like this in my entire life. A lot of the thoughts that were going through my head were, man, my girlfriend's gonna break up with me. I'm not living a good enough life as a follower of Jesus. He doesn't want anything to do with me. I'm gonna lose all my friends. I'm not good enough to be in school and to make the grades to survive in college. I don't know what I wanna do with my life. Um, just all these things kind of stacked on top of each other. Um, that really sent me into a spiral. And then on top of all that, was feeling very anxious at the idea that I was having anxiety. And this feeling of my life crumbling in on me did not go away. I'd go in my car, um, if there were guys in my room, if I was ever feeling anxious, I'd go cry um, until I felt even the slightest bit better. Um, but the minute I'd step out the car, I'd get hit with it again. I'd go to class if I could make it to class that day. And if I couldn't stay through all of class, I'd leave class early, um, go back to my dorm, lay in a fetal position in my bed and cry until I fell asleep. Man, it just felt like it was never going to end. I, I remember well the first time I met Skylar Seedman. Um, I was preaching at the church that he grew up in in the Metroplex and his parents, who are friends of my wife and I's, um, came up and introduced Scholar to us because he was going to be graduating high school that coming May, and then he was going to be coming to Abilene to attend Abilene Christian University. And they wanted him to meet uh, a pastor from a church in Abilene, lots of great churches in Abilene, that he could choose to be a part of at the leading of the Lord. But they wanted him to know at least one pastor from a church where he might attend. And I'll never forget, man, he, he looked at me just square in the eye, stuck his hand out there, gave me that confident, strong handshake that we teach our boys in West Texas. And then he began to verbalize very clearly just what was going on his senior year. And some of the things the Lord was leading him to, he thought leading him to be a part of in his next steps as he journeyed to Abilene, went to college and things such as that. Interestingly, his father called me on the front end of the story that you just heard the first part of. It's not finished yet. And uh, I have to admit that I went back to that first encounter and nothing in that first encounter gave me any indication that anything like this would happen. I mean, it was just the opposite. But on the other hand, I was not utterly shocked. As my granddaddy used to say, this ain't my first rodeo and I've seen the attack of the enemy in the area of anxiety on the increase and the rise in our culture. I know what the enemy is up to. I see it. Not only have I seen it, not only have I experienced it in others, I'm telling you, I've tasted it in my own life, sometimes at a very intense level. You know, I've been blessed to be the pastor here for 21 years, which makes me old. Um, and in that 21 years, there's one thing that's very common in my life Sunday morning is that I get up earlier than normal. I just, I just wake up naturally, no alarm, nothing like that. I just get up earlier than would be the norm in my life. And most of the time, the only thing I can liken it to is like when I was a high school athlete. And I know that my coaches would probably debate whether I should use the term athlete to be true of my life. I mean, I hear me, I was high on zeal, low on ability. I was a lot of fun. I was at the end of the bench looking down, put me in coach. I was always ready to play. I was like 30 seconds of chaos is all I had to offer the team, but it was great. Anyway, and so I like, I was always amped up. I was, I, I wasn't even going to play. I mean, I knew it, but I was ready for game time and such like that. And I liken Sunday morning to that a lot. I love doing this. I love being a part of when God's people gather because the Bible amazingly says that the ever-present God shows up in a special way when people gather in his name. So I know this. I know hope is here because Jesus is here. Jesus shows up, and I, I love it. And so I love being a part of this reality. But there have been a few times in my 21 years that I awakened earlier than even my Sunday morning early norm. 
But this wasn't because I was like amped up, game time, ready to go kind of thing. This was an unable to sleep and all of a sudden stuff going through my mind, like crazy, wild, irrational thoughts, like what if scenarios, worst case scenarios would just come to my mind again and again, I'd be battling because, you know, part of the struggle is that early morning, kind of half awake, kind of half asleep, you know what I'm saying? And be coming, I'd be worshiping, I'd be praying, I'd be doing all the things, but the mind, they just won't go away. And there's been some times that the what if scenarios weren't just what ifs, I became convinced they were real. Like in the moment, I became convinced that all the fruit of all that God had done at Beltway Park was gone and nothing to no avail. Everything had been empty and meaningless in life. There were a couple of times I was convinced that in a few hours when church happened, I'd be the only one there. Like no one was going to be at church um, on that Sunday morning. And I pay people to come to church on Sunday morning sometimes. Even those people weren't going to show up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I know you're thinking, Dave, that, that's crazy, that, that, that's irrational. It may even be the definition of a panic attack. Irrational, crazy, whatever, I'm just telling you it was real. Very real. And if it were only the occasional severe attacks, may, maybe that would be okay. Maybe you could just take it as an attack of the enemy. But there are times, way too many times, when I'll get a bit of news about something. It, it's amazing, at how irrational it will be. I'll just get a bit of news that something's not going the way I think it should be going. And I think everything should be going great all the time. Everything should be moving forward. Everything should be progressing. I'll get a bit of news. It could be about the church. It could be about something in my family. It could be about something going on in somebody's life. It doesn't matter. For some reason on that day, my mind will begin, begin to obsess on it. It will be like a bear trap that grabs hold of it and will not let go. And my mind will race. And from that little bit of news, I'll begin extrapolating all sorts of what ifs. All sorts of issues, all sorts of struggling to be like a weight, a weight on my thought life with all the what ifs. Now, I don't want you to look at me right now like I'm the only one that knows what I'm talking about in here. Don't give me that spiritual look, North Campus. Don't you be doing that to me right now. Don't give me that way. Man, it really is sorry to be you. I wish I didn't go through anything like that. See, I know better. I know reality because I've had enough conversations, I've talked to enough people, enough interactions to know that I'm nowhere close, that me and a handful of others come, are, are not the only ones that really wrestle through this kind of thing. Hear me, social scientists have been shouting at us for a decade and a half now that there is a growing issue, a pandemic of anxiety. Like one study that is, is reported says America is now the most anxious nation in the world. I mean, you got to give it to us Americans. If we're going to do anything, we are going to be number one, right? We're going to go after it, baby. We're going to be the head. We're the most anxious nation in the world. Contrast that to less developing nations. Less developing nations are reported to have one-fifth the anxiety of Americans. Now, let that sink in for a minute. Because it seems just the opposite of what we should be. We have economic prosperity. We have all these access to resources and possibilities and such. But you find those in developing nations, which is another call for third world nations, and they're experiencing 20% only, 80% less anxiety than we are. Dr. Caroline Leaf, who, by the way, is going to be here in about a month, Sunday night, October 6th, special, special time. Dr. Leaf is considered one of the foremost authorities in the nation in the area of cognitive neuroscience. Her books are incredible. She cites in her books um, some statistics. There's lots of them. One says the American Institute of Health estimates 75 to 90 percent of all visits to our doctors, primary care physicians, are for stress-related problems. So let's say that's double wrong. That still means 45, 50% of our doctor visit may be related to anxiety. A study by the American Medical Association says virtually the same thing, that stress is a factor in 75% of all illnesses and disease, a big factor in that. Many social scientists believe that the coming generation right now, Generation Z, so if you're in high school, if you're in junior high, if you're a college student right now, you're a Generation Z. The millennials have now aged out of being the younger generation. They were the most anxious Generation we've had till Generation Z shows up. Generation Z, which is now just entering into college, is said to be the most anxious generation we've ever had. That may not be that big a deal if it were not for the fact that my grandparents, who are also tracked, lived through the Great Depression. And this generation is said to carry far more anxiety than my grandparents' generation through the Great Depression and such. Now, I can't confirm all these numbers. 
I, I know statistics and studies can be manipulated and interpreted to say things. I, I can't validate the conclusion of the social scientists, but I think we know, I, I think we feel right now that things like this, our personal experiences, our own lives, what we find around us, we know that there's something going on. We know that there's some truth. We know this. We know anxiety. Call it worry. Call it stress. Call it whatever you will. Anxiety is a growing issue. Economic prosperity has not resolved it. Technological and psychological, uh, scientific advancements have not solved it in any forms or fashion. See, hear me. I get it. This is not about us feeling guilty. If you think this is about us feeling guilty about being anxious, wrong setup. I just want you to know I get it. And I know guilt. I do guilt really well, just like I've done anxiety really well in the past. I know what Jesus said. I know Matthew 6, 25 says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. I know that verse. I hated that verse for a long time. Like I'd be reading through the gospel of Matthew through the Sermon on the Mount. I would just skip it. I would speed read it or something. I didn't like it because I was anxious and therefore I was a failure. I was failing Jesus. I was failing everything about me and I disliked it. But I made a discovery. And hear me, this is worth your time this morning. If you get nothing else, I want you to get this reality. The commands of Jesus, they're not demands to show us our lack. The commands of Jesus are actually promises meant to show us our potential when we walk with him. So when Jesus says, therefore, do not be anxious about your life, it is possible for us not to be anxious in the overall when it comes to walking with Jesus. Hear me, we are going to see this truth most clearly in the passage we're going to unpack for the next six weeks. So I want you to get to it. Every week for six weeks, starting today, we're going to unpack Matthew chapter 11. So get your Bible, get your phone out, your tablet, whatever form of Bible you have. If you don't have a Bible with you, underneath the chair in front of you, or underneath your chair, north and south campus, we have a black colored Bible. Turn to Matthew 11, it's page 816 in those black Bibles. And if you don't own a Bible, Take that Bible with you. Put your name in the front of it. It's yours. It's our gift to you. I want you to grab hold of it, and I challenge you, memorize three verses. You're going to need these three verses in your life. Memorize these three verses in your life. Let them get deep in your spirit because they are the antidote to the schemes of the enemy when it comes to anxiety. End of the chapter, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let that word sink in. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want you to hear it. Today is about the invitation. I want you to hear it. I want us to dare believe it could be possible. The invitation to Jesus is to a life of rest. And I know this. Every one of us is drawn to that invitation. When we hear Jesus says, I will give you a life of rest, we go, yeah! Every American shooting their hands up and say, I, I, I want that reality. I want rest in my life. We all want it, but I also know this. We think it's impossible in this life. We think it cannot happen. In fact, what most of us who are in church do with these verses is we think they're about heaven. That when I get to heaven, I will be rest, I will be without anxiety. But hear me, look at the verses, especially verse 29, verse 28, verse 29. They can't be about heaven alone. There's too many words that describe this life. Words like labor, words like weary, words like heavy laden and such. And Jesus contrasts, I'm going to give you rest. See, rest is for the here and now. Rest is a word we don't understand. But I promise you we understand the other words. We understand labor, don't we, in verse 28. We get that. Other translations use the word weary, tired. This week, we're going to begin reading a book together, Anxious for Nothing by Max Lucado. Great book. If you don't have one in the four years at all campuses, we have the book available. I want you to pick one up on the way out. All you got to do this week is read chapter one. It is great. The author, what he is going to do is he's going to take Philippians 4, um, Four through eight, he's going to unpack it like we're unpacking Matthew 11. They parallel each other perfectly. And in the first chapter, Lucado says the word anxious defines itself. It is a hybrid of angst and shus. Angst is a sense of unease. Shus is the sound I make on the 10th step of a flight of stairs when my heart beats fast and I run low on oxygen. Come on. And come on, if you can only get up 10 steps and start breathing hard, go to the gym. We need a little help there. No, I can be heard inhaling and exhaling, exhaling, sounding like the second syllable of anxious. 
which makes me wonder if anxious people aren't just that, people who are out of breath because of the angst of life, weary, tired, heavy laden. Anxiety, he says, takes our breath for sure. If only that were all it takes. It also takes our sleep. It takes our energy. It takes our well-being. We get that. We get it here. We understand weary. We understand the what ifs of the future. We understand all those things. We understand all you who are weary and heavy laden. What we don't understand is rest. When Jesus gives the word rest, what we immediately think is the word break. I get a little bit of a break, a respite from that which is normal, a world of work and a world of activity, a world of anxiety. See, in our minds, rest is when we go to sleep. So we work, we labor, we're heavy laden for 16 hours, and then for eight hours we get to sleep if we are the rare American that actually sleeps eight hours. By the way, very few Americans actually sleep eight hours because we actually struggle with the idea of rest. Rest in our minds is when we get a day off from our 50 hour uh, a week work schedule or our school schedule. Rest in our mind is a vacation we just squeeze in, a break. You know what I'm saying? That we so fill with activity that we half jokingly say, I have to have a vacation from my vacation, right? Rest in our mind is a break. Rest in our mind is a respite, a breather from the norm. Hear me, that is not what Jesus is offering. Jesus is not inviting us to have better breaks from a normal life of work, heavy laden, and anxiety and such. Jesus is inviting us to an utter other way of life. You see, we tend to rest from our work and activity. Jesus is inviting us to work and be active from a place of rest. Jesus is inviting you, hear us, he's inviting you to a new normal. It's a supernatural normal way of life. See, notice verse 29, Jesus commands us, and remember, commands are what? Commands are promises. He says, take my yoke upon you. A yoke is an instrument of what? Work. Now, we're going to go into much more detail in a couple weeks on the idea of taking up my yoke, but suffice it to say for this morning that what Jesus is saying is rest is connected, not to a break from our work, but rest is actually the foundation from which we're supposed to work. He says in verse 29, another command, learn of me. If we learn of Jesus, he's talking about our day-to-day -day lives. Do you know that the ways of Jesus aren't just about Sundays? They're not just about plus Thursdays. The ways of Jesus are about life. They're about our money. How many of you are going to use money today? Put your hand up. Yeah, don't do it. You're going to do that, right? How many of you are going to spend some time doing something today, right? How many of us are going to be single? How many of us are going to be married? How many of us are going to raise our kids? I mean, the ways of Jesus talk about all the day-to-day -day stuff, the Monday through Saturday way we live and such. Learn of me my ways. And so when Jesus invites us to rest, he's inviting us to a whole new way of life. He's not inviting us from a break of the norm of heavy laden and anxiety. He is saying there's a new normal I have for you, a supernatural normal in the midst of a world of anxiety, a normal that has as its foundation, its core, rest. Hear the truth this morning. Rest is not a break, but a posture, a mindset, a foundation from which we live. I mean, think about it. What if your life was just characterized in the whole by the word rest? Doesn't the thought of that just make you breathe a little easier? And immediately, the enemy wants to come in and tell you it's impossible. Don't let him take it. Before you dismiss me as thinking of the impossible, I want you to think about some scriptures. Because I'm going to tell you this is God's design. God's intent. We know that because we go back to the beginning. You go to the book of Genesis. The word Genesis in Hebrew means beginnings. It tells us in chapters 1 through 3, the creation account, how God made everything we know. He would speak, and out of nothing would something come. Everything he made. So God created for six days. He chose to make man, not on day one, not on day three, not on day five, but he sovereignly and purposely chose to make him on day six. Now think about that. Don't miss it. He could have made him on day two. He could have made woman on day four. He could have chosen any day to make man and woman, to make humanity. But God in his sovereignty, in his purposes, chose day six. Somewhere in the process of day six, God made humanity. And then on day seven, God did what? 
God rested. The God who never gets tired, who never gets overwhelmed, who never gets weary, the God who is all sufficient, the all sufficient one rested. I will charge you that he did not rest because he was tired or he needed it. I will charge you he rested for us to show us who we are to be and the way he designed us to be in life. Think about it. Adam and Eve created on day six. The first full day of their existence was day seven, a day of rest. They started their existence from a foundation of rest. You see, Adam and Eve were created not to work and then get a break. The father's design was to live out their mission from a place of rest. In the creation account, it also says seven times something like this. Then there was evening and then there was morning the first day. Now, interestingly, that's flip-flop the way we think about a day. We would say there was morning and there was evening the first day, but that's opposite of that. Based on these verses, which are said seven times, day one, day two, day three, so forth, the, in Jewish thought, the day doesn't start in the morning like we think. We don't wake up and we wake up and start our day. They don't. They lay their heads down and go to sleep and start their day. It's a different mindset. So in their mindset, Jewish people, actually ancient people as a whole, they would have went to sleep not long after the sun went down. Very expensive to use candles and oils and things like that to light a house. And so they just went to bed when the sun went down. They woke up a little bit before the sun came up. Boom, daylight. And they worked through daylight hours and they made the most, right? You got to make hay while the sun's shining, what granddads used to say. That was the whole way they lived their life. It was the norm in their mindset. It's interesting. I'm going to challenge it as biblical. In the biblical worldview, the day started not with the morning. The day actually started with sleep. The day didn't end with rest, but started, had its foundation in rest. Keep going on through the Bible. You find God gloriously rescuing the Jewish people from Egyptian captivity. And he promises through Moses that he's going to take them to a land of promise, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that will be for them the foundation from which they can live the freedom he desires for them. But that first generation of free Jewish slaves refused to walk into the land of promise. Now, later on in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, that picture of that first generation being unwilling to walk into the land of promise is used as an analogy of our salvation of what we have when we say yes to follow Jesus. But the wording the Hebrew writer uses is really interesting. Listen to it. He says, so then there remains a Sabbath what? A what? A rest, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God has from him. You think he's trying to tell us something? And then the command. Remember, commands are promises. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Let us be a people who live our lives from that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. See, these verses are giving us an image comparing our journey of salvation with the children of Israel going into the promised land. But it says here that our salvation has at its core something called rest. We know salvation isn't a one-time event. It's not something that happens when we say yes to Jesus and we're on our, on our own. Salvation is an ongoing process where we are growing to be that which he has already made us to be. And growing in our salvation, according to Hebrews chapter 4, is connected to the idea of growing into living life from a place of rest. Disobedience, which by the way would mean being anxious, disobedience is actually connected to the failure to enter into the rest of God. Hear it. Let it sink in. I dare you to begin to believe it. The Father longs for us not just to have moments of rest, but a life that is characterized by rest. Let me ask you again, what would your life be like? If you could close your eyes and the nature of your life was rest, might anxiety be pushed down and pushed out. Even in the Old Testament prophets, which we like to say are so harsh, I don't even like to read them, tucked away in the book of Isaiah, for thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in repentance and rest shall you be saved. 
in quietness and trust is your well-being. But you were unwilling. I wonder how often it is that we're really unwilling to enter the rest of God. And the invitation of Jesus is to strive to enter in to that rest. Can we dare hear it? Come on. Can we dare believe it in the midst of a nation that is longing for this thing? Who's crying out going, yes, something needs to change. Something needs to be different. Can we, the people of God, hear the invitation of our Messiah, the invitation of our Lord saying there's an other way to live your life. You don't have to live by the norm of this society. You don't have to live by what is common among you. I have something else to offer you. Would you come? Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened. And we would go, that's me. That's me. I promise you we'd all raise our hands. We'd all lift them up. I am wearied and burdened. Jesus says, come to me. And I'm going to give you something different. I'm going to give you not religion, not activities to attend. I'm going to give you something deep inside. I'm going to give you rest. To which by now, you're probably saying, how do we do that? I need this. How do we do it? You got to come back in the next weeks to find out. That's what we're going to unpack together. And we're going to learn to walk in together. This is a journey. And we're going to learn how to do it together. That's why you need to be a part. That's why you need to get the book on the way out. And you read chapter one. A lot of you are overachievers. You grab the book. You've read it. You've started reading it already. I've heard everybody say, this is incredible. This is incredible. This is incredible. Absolutely, it's a timely word. You need to grab the book, Anxious for Nothing, on your way out. It's great. If you're not part of a group, I'm just telling you, God's got purposes for big environments. He's got purposes for small environments. If you're not part of a group, you need to be part of one. Go to the South Foyer. If you're at the South Campus, go to the Foyer. If you're at the North Campus, you go to the place that says groups, and we're going to get you in a group. All you got to do is be part of one for six weeks. That's it. I mean, we do that, and we're going to journey together on how to do that. I want you to invite some people. There's people in your life that need to believe this. In the chair back at both campuses are pieces of paper like this. I want you to grab one. I want you to take it. These pieces of paper do no good to us in about two weeks. They are going to be recycled. The best we can do with them is for you to take one, two, three, five. You use them and invite people. Take a picture of one. Text it to people. Do things like that. Be a part of it. And then be part of the services. And I promise you, Jesus is going to meet you. Be part of one of our five weekend services at two locations. If you're going to be out on the weekend, remember we have Plus Thursday. Incredible service we have there. I want you to be part of this journey. Make it a priority as we grow in our faith. Hear me. Look at me. There's a better way to live our lives. It is the way of rest. It is the way Jesus lived when he was on the earth. Rest is what we see in Jesus. See, when we read the four Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus' life, we rarely, if ever, see him overwhelmed or anxious. Like, I would challenge you, you want to be an overachiever, read during the six week, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just ask yourself, when was Jesus anxious or when was he overwhelmed? When was he worried? And I'm going to challenge you. You can find one time that maybe that was true. I'll even give you a heads up. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm going to challenge you. He wasn't even anxious at the Garden of Gethsemane. There was a weight coming upon him. There was a grief, but I don't think it was anxiety. We can debate that sometime. I'll win because I'm good at debating. Now, I don't know, but we can go through. But other than that, I promise you, what you're not going to find is you're not going to find him overwhelmed. What you're going to find is you're going to find the story of Jesus being um, on the Lake of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is called in the Bible. Big, big lake. He's there with 12 apostles. Now remember, of the 12 apostles, the 12 closest disciples, most of them grew up on that lake. They were from lakeside towns. They were from Bethsaida. They were from Capernaum. They were fishermen. They had grown up their whole lives on this lake. And it says a storm came against them that was so grand and so great that experienced men of the sea were fearful for their lives. Where was Jesus? He was asleep. Not just asleep, he was asleep in the front of the boat. How many of you have been in a like big waves at some point in your life, hands up? And you're saying, we're from Texas, we don't ever get in waves. I get that. If you've ever been in big waves, my wife and I scuba dive and we got out one time, six foot swell, shouldn't have been out. A little boat, you know what a front of a boat does? Front of the boat goes up and then whack, it slams into the trough and then it does it again, whack. Whack, 
because they were going against the ways. I know the direction they were going to the Lake of Galilee. And the whole time that boy Jesus is in the front of the boat sawing logs. In the midst of a storm that seemed like it was going to consume them, Jesus lived from a place of rest. Not the absence of the storm, in the midst of it. Could we dare believe that we could have such a faith? I think it's your destiny. When Jesus was before the Roman governor, the lead dude in their area, a representative of Caesar himself, being falsely accused about crimes he did not commit. The scripture says, but that when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave them no answer. He didn't defend himself. Pilate said to him, hey, hey, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave Pilate no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Jesus was at rest in the plans and purposes of God, even to the point of going to the cross. That Jesus, who lived in this world, invites us to that. Now, I know some of you think right now, 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 Jesus didn't live in the same kind of world we live in. It was a simple world. He didn't have smartphones to deal with. He didn't have cars. He didn't have all the issues our kids face. He didn't have all the advancements, all that kind of stuff. The world, like we know it today, is crazy compared to back then. You're right. He didn't have the world compared to that. All Jesus had to deal with was the weight of the sins of humanity, past, present, and future, all placed upon him. That's it. Other than that, no stress in his life. And that Jesus lived at a place of rest. It's amazing. Read the Gospels. All through the book of John, it will say, wasn't his time. Just throw it away. Wasn't his time. He knew it wasn't his time. Wasn't his time. One time they wanted to throw him off a cliff. Wasn't it time? So he walked through the crowd. Like, whoo, went through him. I mean, there was all sorts of things the boy did. All about rest. All about rest. He lived this life for rest. And that Jesus who lived the world we lived in, I'm going to challenge, lived it at a weight that we've never experienced. And says, there's a power from on high that I walked in, that I give to you, that you can have. I invite you to it. I invite you. And I dare you this morning to believe it. Close your eyes, if you don't mind. And I want you to hear the invitation. Don't just read the words. Don't let them just pass by you. There's an utterly other way for us to live. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Come to me, all you who feel overwhelmed. Come to me, all you who look to the future and all the what ifs, take the joy from your life. Come to me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest. Not a break from the life. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. I finally decided to call my mom and dad really after like a couple of hours in my car of I couldn't stop crying. I literally cried into the phone um, probably for the next hour and a half. My mom and dad uh, suggested that like we go see um, like a therapist and I was not for it at the moment. So after several weeks of like my anxiety being at its most intense and doctors working with me, taking medication for all this, and my mom living with me in Abilene. My therapist referred me to a, just a local pastor um, in Abilene who had gone through the same exact stuff. And it was really comforting because when we were talking and he was finishing my sentences and like completing my thoughts, literally like knew exactly how I was feeling. We went into a time of prayer um, and he prayed over me and we sat in silence for a little bit and he asked me um, to picture like me and Jesus together. Um, and this picture I got in my head was, it was me and Jesus 
um, and we were in a dump, um, like garbage um, surrounding us, um, stacked infinitely high um, to where like I could only see trash all around me um, and then Jesus across from me. Um, but his back was facing me. So we continued praying. I asked Jesus to come closer and he turned towards me um, and reached out his hand. And I reached out for his hand too. And then he snapped his fingers and the whole place like erupted in flames. Um, The dump that we were in, the garbage, like all of it was on fire. But I felt more at peace looking at him with his arms stretched out to me, with fire surrounding me, than I did with none of it on fire and his face turned away from me. Um, And when I got up from that moment, I was crying. Um, And I remember um, like opening my eyes and for the first time, like feeling like I'm gonna be okay. 